to families for being behind this and it's certainly a pleasure to be able to learn together with you. So not, not much you can say after Rabbi Olofsky, you know. I guess the only advantage have, I have is that I speak English. <laughs> so uh, let's at least Let's at least use that to study something about tshuva. And what I'd like, with your permission, is to look at the laws of tshuva, try to cover that. I'm sure you're all halachic black belts and don't, don't really need that. But let's revise, at least review the laws of tshuva. And let's see if we can find the time as well to delve a little bit beneath the surface and explore some of the meaning or some of the more profound aspects of the mitzvah of tshuva. Many questions, of course, many questions here. Why do we not do tshuva in Rosh Hashanah if that's the Day of Judgment? Why do we do it afterwards, or to some extent before, some extent after? How does saying a few words in a few seconds counterbalance the weight of our vera, which normally needs an enormous degree of suffering, or it needs at least a counterbalancing spiritual effort how does a few words achieve that? There are many questions here. Let's start with a beautiful thought that I heard from Rav Moshe Shapira. I'm sure Rabbi Olofsky heard the same idea that the month of Elul has a unique quality. <clears throat> it isn't only <clears throat> a preparation. It has its own identity. And I think it sets the stage very well for this discussion. You know, I'm sure you're aware there are many clues to the month of Elul. I am to my beloved, my beloved is to me, or a pasuk relating to bris, which is a covenant between us and Hashem. There are many beautiful hints to the nature of Elul. But one of them is very perplexing. When the Torah talks about the, the mitzvah of cities of refuge, <clears throat> somebody kills someone accidentally, they have to flee, exile to a city of refuge. The pasuk there says, Valokim inaliyadoi, which means Hashem has brought this about in some sense, the person died accidentally, and then they have to flee to a city of refuge. Those words, is Elul. And the question is, what is a person dying accidentally and the consequent punishment or effect of exile, what does it have to do with Elul? Well, the idea is this. You know that the consequence of killing is exile. Right? The response, that means that in Hashem's scheme, when someone is killed, the result is that the perpetrator has to go into exile. What's the classic example of that? Cain. Right? When Cain kills Hevel, so then he becomes an exile. Neither not to you. You lose your place. <coughs> More fundamentally, when... When Adam, Adam Arisha in sins, is exiled from the garden. Sin, of course, is bringing death to the world. That's what he does. The result of his mistake is that he brings death to the world. He becomes mortal. And the consequence is that he's exiled. <clears throat> when a person kills someone accidentally, they lose their place in the world. They're exiled to a... Right? They have to leave where they are. <clears throat> Probably the concept here is that killing someone really means depriving them of their place. Right? You know that the existence that we inhabit here is called Hamakim. It's one of Hashem's names. The person who's killed is left this place, gone to another one. Why do we say Hamakim Yenachim Eschem? Why when we comfort someone do we use the name of Hashem, the place? It's a very unusual term. We don't use it often. The concept is the comfort is realizing that the person still exists in a different place. Hashem is a broader sense of place. But the immediate consequence of killing somebody is that you deprive them of this place. Place is a deep thing. It means makom is a mekayem. Really, it means gives them the possibility of existence in this dimension. And therefore, the midi connected mid is when somebody kills someone else, they lose their place in the world. So then a person who's killed someone, the consequence is they have no place to be. And then the Torah says, but there's a special place called a ira miklat. That is a place for those who have no place. And that's what Elul is. Elul is for the end of the year when already we have been soiled, we've done things wrong, we left the purity that we experienced last Yom Kippur. 
And every Avera really is a dimension of death in the world. Something's been killed. And by the time Elul arrives, when there's a weight of that responsibility, so in a sense we have no place to be. Elul is the place for those who have no place. And therefore we stand in a rarefied zone here, which is called Elul. It's a time to think about becoming, as you heard, great and not small. And the pathway to that is Tshuva. So let's think about that. First of all, you know they translate it in a very Christian way as repentance. But in fact, that's just a small part of the mitzvah of Tshuva. Tshuva really means return. The word Tashuv, or the root Shav, is the same as the root of Shabbat. Shabbos is really a return to the moment of creation. Zechel and And Tshuva is a return to the moment of your own creation. Tshuva is a return to the purity that we inhabited or experienced or manifested before we began to make mistakes in the world. This is much deeper than repentance or, or remorse. That's an element, but it's a much more radical work. And if you understand that Tshuva means going back to your own essence, to your own purity, I think it's a very short step to understand why Rosh Hashanah does not involve Tshuva. Let's think about that for a moment. Here's a day of judgment. Hashem is judging you. Your life is on the line, quite literally. <clears throat> There's not a word personally. Not a word of Tshuva, no vidui. In fact, all our sources say it's downright dangerous to single yourself out. The last thing you want to do on Rosh Hashanah is mention yourself. You know the famous incident when the Shunamis, childless woman. So Elisha offered to do what he could for her. She showed him a great kindness. He called her in and he said, What can I do for you? Can I speak to the king for you? And all the Mephoshim say he meant the real king, not only his political connections in the, in the limited world. And she was childless. She certainly had a need. And he was a great prophet. <coughs> he could give her a bracha that would result in a child. In fact, that's what happened later. She refused to ask for it. <coughs> she said, <laughs> I sit among my people. And the Mephoshim said it was Rosh Hashanah that day. And that's a day where you don't want to mention yourself and your needs. You want to mention that you're part of the Jewish people. If there's a hope you have, it is as far as you are part of the Jewish people. She wouldn't single herself out. Rosh Hashanah, we don't single ourselves out. Very dangerous thing to do. So here's a day when you're being judged. You hide among the Jewish people and there's not an effort of tshuva. Yes, we prepare beforehand. Elul should be the time for that. And Yom Kippur afterwards, we'll do an intense work of tshuva. But the classic question is, does it make sense? First, let's do the correction. Then let's be judged. The answer is that Rosh Hashanah is the deepest form of tshuva. It isn't a dealing with details. Yom Kippur is the time when you deal with details alphabetically and this way and backwards and forwards and all the details that you have picked up and the, 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 the mistakes that have accrued. Rosh Hashanah is something much more fundamental. Rosh Hashanah is a return to the basic personality, the Nakuda, that means the essence of purity. There's no deeper tshuva than that. You know, the idea is, in all Torah processes, the moment of beginning contains the totality. It's always like that. The conception of a child. The moment the child is conceived, the whole future is laid down. The shape of his nose and color of his eyes. It's all there. It just hasn't been revealed yet. The deep sources say that the world was not created in six days. It was created in one instant. But it was revealed over six days. The moment of beginning in Torah is always the moment of totality. It's a question of simply of revelation later. You see so many examples. You know, the Gemara says that many sources say that the entire Torah is contained in the word Bereshit. All the permutations of the word Bracious, you rearrange those six letters every which way, speaks another point of beginning. Why, is, why are we anxious to hear that the whole Torah, is, you know that the Gona Vilna was famous for saying that every mitzvah is contained in the word Bracious. In fact, once they were sitting at a pigeon aben, redemption of the firstborn. So they turned to the Rebbe, the Gona, and they said to him, you told us that every mitzvah is contained in the word Bracious. Where is pigeon aben contained in the word Bracious? And the Gona said, ben, rishon, achash, leshim, yoim, tifte. Right? Those are the six letters spell out that mitzvah. This is not some kind of game. This is that the point of origin contains the totality. You know, the Torah has two beginnings. It has a chronological beginning in Breshis and a spiritual beginning in Anoichi. And the Gemara says the same thing. The whole Torah is contained in the Ten Commandments. The whole Ten are contained in the first one. The whole of the first one is contained in the word Anoichi. The whole of that is contained in the Aleph. Back and back and back and back to the point of origin. The whole Torah is contained in Aleph. That's clear. What is an Aleph? It's two yuds and a vav, right? It's, two, it's one yud coming down from the spiritual world, the ten higher emanations, as they're reflected and re, re, yeah, 
inverted, reflected in this world, joined by the letter Vav, which means the letter of connection. Vav means and. The Hebrew word Vav means a hook. So it's the spiritual world being connected with the physical, which is what the letter Aleph says. And of course, two yuds in the Vav is 26, Hashem's name. Or 32, if you spell Vav Vav, which is the name of the creation itself, as all you black belt Kabbalists, I'm sure, are aware. <laughs> so the Aleph really says it all. Again, this is not a game. This is the concept that the further you push back to the moment of compressed essence, the more you have everything. You know, by the way, whenever we learn these subjects that we call Hashkafa, Machshava, whatever you want to call it, the non-halachic areas of Torah. You know, people are not aware of the principles of this field. Most people who have a halachic background, a learning background, are quite comfortable learning and preparing and presenting a halachic subject. If I said to any of you here, research a halachic matter, whatever it is, right? Give a professional presentation, I'm sure you could do it. But most people with a serious background in, in, in Judaism and in Torah, you ask them to prepare a subject that relates to the deeper realm, the realm of Jewish thought and philosophy, don't know where to begin. Because we've not been taught the keys, the codes that govern this area. And they are organized, cohesive principles that, <clears throat> that unfold this area. And one of them is, in any Torah subject that you want to understand deeply, take it back to its point of origin. Because there it is contained. No one serious about anatomy would ever study the body without going back into the form of, embry of the embryo, where it forms in pregnancy. And no one serious about that would do that without going back to genetics. You always go back to the point of origin that compressed contains everything. The first time a thing appears in Torah is where its essence is. Because that's where it swims into focus in being created. The Gemara says in Brachas, I roi a test b'chaloim, somebody who sees the letter test, the ninth letter of the alphabet, yitzapa le toiv, expects something good to happen. Why? Because the word toiv in Hebrew begins with a test. The Gon of Vilna asks the obvious question. There are many very bad words in Hebrew that begin with a test. But the first time a test appears in Chumash is in ki toiv. And if that's the first time the letter appears, that's where its deepest essence is expressed. It's a wonderful principle, this. It means that all bad words that begin with that letter must have an essence in goodness too, obviously. So we go back to a moment of essence. And that's what Rosh Hashanah is. It's the day of the conception of the year. And that's why it's so important to look perfect on that day, because the rest of the year must look the same. The Kabbalists would not sleep on Rosh Hashanah. Because this essence is determining the rest of the year. You don't want to be unconscious. <coughs> And that's the importance of the day. This is more than tshuva, if you like. This is not worrying about the details. This is going back to the essence of who you are. And what is the essence? We mention only one thing on Rosh Hashanah. Hashem, you're king, and I represent that. That's all. Not a mention of ourselves. Because this is a day of definition of what essence is. There's no deeper tshuva than that. You know, if you want a business analogy. The business analogy is when you have a meeting with a, you know, your employer. That right? runs a company. So you go into the meeting... And you start discussing with him, you know, salary and expenses and details and the thickness of a carpet in your office and, you know, you're making a bad mistake. The first thing to discuss is whether you have a job next year. The first thing to convince him is that you're worth employing. And the way you say that is, this is the greatest company, I want to work for it. After he's re-employed you, over the next 10 days you negotiate salary and expenses and all the details, that's fine. But you look like an idiot negotiating that if you haven't been employed. Rosh Hashanah is only one thing. Hashem, you the king and the reality, I represent you. That's all. You can't do a more effective tshuva than that. You know, the Mishnah says that a person's like a tree. A person's like a tree. A tree can be planted in good soil, <clears throat> but it can have some branches hanging over into a bad place. Mishnah in Kedushin. Or a tree can be planted in a good place, and it can have branches hanging into a bad place. <clears throat> what does that mean? That if a tree is in a good place and has some branches in a bad place, a little pruning will clarify the tree as a unitary existence. A person who is a good person has done to some of various. Hashem lops those off with a little pruning, a little suffering in this world. When he gets to the next world, he's clarified in purity. A person can be a bad person, tree planted in bad earth, but the worst person on earth has some mitzvahs. So they need a little pruning. Hashem gives him a few yachts in the Caribbean and a few paltry billion dollars, that kind of thing, lifetime of pleasure and ecstasy, paying him out, pruning off the branches. That's one of the reasons, by the way, why some bad people have pleasure and benefit and blessing in this world. Very bad, very bad destiny. 
That is a pruning of the details. Why? So that when they leave here, they're clarified as bad. I mean, there's a side point here which is fascinating. And that is, a person who's good and suffers in this world so that they get an eternal ecstasy, that makes sense. But a person who's bad in this world and is paid out for his mitzvahs in this world, that's not fair. Did you see the discrepancy? A mitzvah is worth infinity. This world's not enough to pay for a mitzvah. Yeah, it's a principle that you can't be paid for a mitzvah in this world. So is Hashem being fair? Here's this evil person who's done some mitzvahs. He doesn't get infinity for his mitzvahs. He gets a finite reward. That's not fair. You know, a mitzvah cannot be paid in this world. It's like, I don't know, in America, in South Africa, if you drive through the Karoo, it's like a thousand miles of desert. And you're holding in your, you have in your pocket a check for a million rands. I guess in America you're driving through, I don't know, some forsaken place in the Midwest and you pass through your Huppertsville. I don't know, there's got to be some little place... Yeah, the whole town is one little shack. And you're very thirsty, you want to drink a Coke. So you walk into the shack and you want to cash your check for a million dollars. The person passes out, he's never seen that much money. Holding a mitzvah in your hand is like a check that can't be cashed here. When you get back home in the big city, you can walk into a bank, the fellow yawns and pays you a million dollars. When you leave this place and you get back home where they can cash such a check, you get a reward. So a person in this world who's done mitzvahs, who's a bad person... And he gets paid a finite reward? The answer is, Hashem would love to give him an infinite reward, but he's not there. In other words, he's translated his infinite value into a finite currency. All Hashem can do is give him all the pleasure of this world. The Rambam puts it very clearly in the Ramchal quotes him. All you need for a share in the next world is one mitzvah done for the right reason. You have to open an account. If you open an account, you can get dividends. But a person who's evil by definition is not invested in that world. Therefore, he cannot be paid out there. He shrunk the value of that infinity into the finite. So now, the Rambam says, this tree that's planted in a good place, a bad place, says the Rambam, most um, amazing statement. In Hilkos Chuba, the Rambam says, most people on earth are exactly 50-50 people. He says that mitzvahs and averis are weighed up, and Rosh Hashanah is a, is a judgment for balance. 51% good, Seal for life immediately. That's what he says. It goes according to majority. 49% good, death immediately. Spiritual death. It's judged on the question. It doesn't say numbers. Weight also counts. But there's a weighing up here and majority determines. And then he says, and most people on earth are 50-50. <clears throat> you should see yourself as 50-50. And one mitzvah swings the balance. Not only for you, for your city, for your country, for the whole world. The question is, are most people on earth 50-50 exactly? That's very improbable. 50.000 most of us? The answer is this. Rosh Hashanah is a day of judgment according to majorities means <clears throat> where's your essence? Where's your tree planted? Most people on earth are 50-50. They never moved their tree. <clears throat> when you're born, you're born exactly 50-50, not good or bad. The Rambam says you can be born intelligent, talented, wise. It's, you can't be born good or bad. Born neutral. Most human beings have never moved their tree. Most human beings get a chance to do a good deed, certainly do it. Cut a couple of corners and take a chance, available for that. Most humans have never made a policy decision, where's my tree planted? Rosh Hashanah's only one judgment, where's your tree? Just one step, that's all that's needed. Later you'll work out the details on your kip. Then you'll start lopping off branches and pruning and, and... Rosh Hashanah's a din on only one thing. What's your definition of essence? Who are you? That is Chuba. Shiva later, the details, I did this, I did that, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Those are the details. And therefore, so certainly do Shiva. You know what the shofar is? Shofar is a sound of essence. No, it's only one mitzvah in Rosh Hashanah. And that's a shofar. What is that? You know that the breath and the voice are the root of expression. The law, the din of the shofar is that it has to be an inarticulate cry. You want to go back to the root of expression of self. By the time it gets to words, it's too late. Words always lie. At best, they're little pieces of the truth. A cry, a scream. No amount of words can say what one scream of a child in the night can say. That's unmistakable. And the din of the shofar is it's an inarticulate scream. It's the sound of the neshama. You know that the, whenever the Torah wants to talk about prophecy, it doesn't talk about words. It talks about voice. Voice is the root of expression. And that cannot be misunderstood. When Sarah knows something prophetically that Abraham Avin is not aware of, Hashem says, listen to your wife. She's speaking with prophecy. Shema Bekoila. Listen to her voice. Not listen to her words. That's too late. Go to the root. Voice. 
Hashem says to the Navi, Cry out in your throat. doesn't talk about the words in the mouth. Do not hold back. Lift your voice like a shofar. By the way, you know voice comes from the neck, just as an aside. Voice comes from the, the zone of junction between the higher and the lower worlds. The head is the world of spirit and potential. The body is the world of action. As deep as you can get, the root, the connection between the two is in the throat. The voice is formed there. Why, why do you have a neck, incidentally? Why were you created with a neck? You could have walked around like this. Why did Hashem give you a neck? A neck is always the connection between higher and lower worlds. What is the symbol of the neck in Torah always? Whenever the Torah talks about a neck, what is it meaning? Right? When Yosef and Binyamin meet each other after years and they cry. And they cry on each other's neck. And Rashi says they were crying about the Besam Mikdash. How does Rashi know? Neck is the connection, that part of the world that connects the higher world of the spirit with the lower world of the body. That's the world of the Besam Mikdash. The neck is always the zone of connection. By the way, the voice is formed in the front of the neck. You know, in Rabbi Wilana mentioned Kabbalah. In the deeper sources, you know, it says that the front of a thing is always the side of Kedusha, sanctity. The back of a thing is always the side of darkness. The front of the body is the side of relationship, uniqueness, recognizability, relationship. The back is always the side of darkness, excretion, foreignness, negativity. The voice is formed in the front of the neck. The zone of connection in its manifestation of Kedusha. By the way, in Kabbalistic works, this part of the body is called Moshe Rabbeinu. Or Koen Godel, it's called. Because this is the voice, by the way, you know, there's a Kabbalistic technique that if you want to see the dark side of a thing, the negative side, then you read it backwards. You know that? You read the word backwards. This part of the body is called Haoref, the back of the neck. When you spell it backwards, it spells Paroi. Pharaoh. This is Moshe, brings the voice of Hashem into the world. This is Paroi, who says, Mi Hashem, we don't know about him. <clears throat> right? These are the. And the shofar is that expression. The word shofar, you know what it means? The word shofar means that which we blow. It also means to improve or uplift. Shipru ma'asoychem. It also means to beautify, to become beautiful. Shapiri di Yerushalayim, the beautiful people of Yerushalayim. And there's one other Hebrew meaning of the word shofar. Anyone speak Hebrew? It also means the amniotic membrane and fluid. Shvir, in Hebrew, the same word, means when the baby is conceived, it's held in a, in, a, in a membrane with liquid. That's called mei shafir. Amazing. Blowing the shofar takes you back into the embryonic purity, right? before birth, as it were. And therefore, it's inarticulate before words are formed, and there's no tshuva as deep as that. And therefore, of course, we do Tshuva and Rosh Hashanah. We go back to the statement of our essence. And our essence is, Hashem will align with you. you all that's real, and I want to be part of that. Let's look at the mitzvah of Tshuva. Let's map it out. There are two sets of laws of Tshuva. One I'm not going to speak about this evening. Let's focus on the other. One set is the Tshuva that has to be done before death. You know, the Rambam goes through Tshuva in ten chapters, ten prakim. And when he gets to the seventh, he starts repeating what he began the first chapter with, the laws of tshuva. But if you look carefully, you'll see it's not a repetition. There he's speaking about the tshuva that needs to be done just before dying. Right? And that is because there are, there's a special form of tshuva that needs to be done, not in expiation for particular deeds that were done that were inadequate, but a regret and a remorse for a life that was not perfectly lived. It's a global sense of, not only did I not... It means I did damage in the world, but not only that, you gave me an opportunity, a life, looks, intelligence, opportunities, and I didn't use them maximally. There should be special remorse for that. And the Mishnah says clearly, you have to do that only once, and that's one day before dying. One day before death, a person has to do that sort of tumor. What's the problem with that? Then on which day, right? So the Mishnah says you have to do it every day. Right? Do that every day. That's a global tumor. And many people do that before going to sleep at night, or the end of the Amida, you can do that. That is a general type of a vidui, and that needs its own study. Let's not go into that now. Let's look at the basic laws of tshuva and make a review. Tshuva has, as I'm sure you're aware, five components. Three essential ones that always must be done, and two that need to be done in certain circumstances. Let's make a map, right? How's your imagination? Here's our blackboard, right? You've got five components. So you've got first three components that always need to be done, 
and two, when the sin was directed against someone else. Right? Every Avera needs three elements in order to correct it. But if the sin had a human victim, like where someone is damaged financially, or emotionally, or physically, right, where there's a target, as it were, a victim, a human victim, besides a transgression in its own right, then before you can do the three steps of tshuva, you have to make up the damage that you caused and gain the person's forgiveness. And you can readily see that's where it gets very difficult. Very messy. The other three are easy. Vidu, you confess, say you regret it, say you won't do it again, no problem. Making up the damage when you've hurt someone and getting their forgiveness, very messy. Hashem is easy to deal with. People can be very problematic in case you hadn't noticed. And therefore, until further notice, confine your Averas right, to the ones that deal only with Hashem. People are difficult. So, but let's, let's look at the three ones that are always essential, and then we try and leave time and look at the more difficult ones, perhaps, which is those which, where are the people are involved, how you correct that. So let's go through the three components. They are vidu, confession, saying what you did, expressing shame and remorse, and saying you'll never do it again. You can't possibly forget them. It's past, present, and future. Past, remorse for the past, present, the vidu, the confession, and declaration for the future that one will never do it again. By the way, can one do chuba without vidu? Think about that for a moment. person is sincerely regretting the past, and, re- and, re- and resolving never to do that again, and in fact they don't do it again. They move in an entirely different direction. But they never said vidu. For example, they couldn't, they went to hospital with a tube in their throat. Or there wasn't time. A tube done just before dying. Can one do chiva without vidu? What would you say? It's very clear that you can, but it's a different kind of chiva. But Salak Akain in the first, in this beginning of Takana Sashabim, goes into this in detail. You can do a remorse, you can have remorse and regret for the past and correct yourself without vidu, and you don't have to be Jewish for that. That's a natural human ability to wrench oneself away from a bad path and move in a good direction. That's a natural thing. You were defined by a bad destination, living a bad life, and you know, you've moved on to a good path. Why not? But that's not the mitzvah of vidu. And the difference is enormous. By the way, there are many proofs that that can be done. The Gemara has many instances of people, in fact non-Jews, who died in an act of tshuva, without any time for confession. The Roman executioner who was burning Rabbi Hanina ben Trajo into death, who kindly let him die sooner rather than later, threw himself into the flames, and is guaranteed a place in the next world. There was no vidui there, and he wasn't Jewish. But the difference is this. A person who redefines their life and takes themselves from a bad path to a good. So Rosh Shapiro said it's like a train going to a bad destination that's now been switched on a new track to a good destination. But the baggage remains attached. Can't undo the baggage like that. You're a new person from here on in. But the past has to be paid for. That would be miraculous to be detached. Chuva, the mitzvah of Chuva the Vidui, detaches the past. That's its miracle. In fact, Chuva done correctly not only detaches the past, but converts it into a positive. Do you know the most famous question? We wouldn't be doing justice to the subject unless we mentioned this. The most famous question in latter day commentaries. Is that which Rabbi Hanan Wasserman asked the Chavetz Chaim? Are you familiar with the question? The classic. He once asked the Chavetz Chaim, what's the big deal about tshuva? Isn't it just another version of regretting the past? You know, there's a concept in the Gemara that says, it's called Toyhe ala Rishonis. If a person regrets the past, you undo the past. The Gemara says this, if you regret a mitzvah, you undo the mitzvah. It needs careful analysis. <coughs> it's not what it seems to be at face value. But in some sense, a person regrets a mitzvah, you lose the mitzvah. That's what it says. So you ask the Chavetz Chaim, well, if you can regret a mitzvah and lose it, doesn't it make obvious sense that you can regret an Avera and lose it? Do you hear the question? Hashem creates the world, perfect spiritual balance. If you can regret the past and erase it, you can regret a mitzvah and erase it, you lose it, then it follows you should be able to regret an Avera and lose it. And what's the big deal about Shiva? Well, this is a wonderful subject and it needs a lot of analysis. But I'll tell you the answer the Chavetz Chaim gave, which is perhaps the simplest. Much deeper answers as well, more complex answers. The Chavetz Chaim said this, when you regret a mitzvah, a mitzvah in the past, you lose the mitzvah. When you regret an Avera, you don't lose it, it becomes a mitzvah. That's miraculous. 
That's remarkable. That doesn't happen when you regret mitzvahs. That's the beginning of an answer. There's much more to say. So that needs vidu. For that you have to speak. And the requirements are three. All need to be spoken. The Rambam phrases it in one sentence. And one should blaze this into one's memory. Because in one sentence, 30 seconds, you can cover it all. And he says, this is what you say. Ana Hashem. Which they translate very weakly as please. Ana is much more than that. But Ana Hashem, you address Hashem. Chatasi ovisi pashati lafanecha. Which means, I sinned in front of you in three levels of intentionality. Accidental sin. Deliberate sin. Secondly, that means I knew it was wrong, I did it anyway. And thirdly, I did it because it was wrong. Right? The childish, rebellious, don't tell me what to do. So, all three levels of intention, in front of you. Not just something that was sort of socially unacceptable, but against your command. That's the preamble. And then you say, And I did X, Y, Z. Fill in on the dotted line what it is that you did. That's the video. And then you say, I regret and I'm ashamed of what I did. Regret and shame, by the way. Rabbi Yena, who goes through this mitzvah in much more detail, lists 17 requirements for children, not just three. So if you want to be a black belt, then you go through all 17 requirements. But there are three basic categories, and the remorse includes remorse and regret. And finally, I'll never do this thing again. One smooth and beautiful expression, 30 seconds, right, written on two lines, and the whole thing is expunged. That is the effectiveness of children. By the way, does it immediately reverse the effect of the sin? The Rambam says, depends what kind of sin. If it's the most lenient category, like a positive mitzvah that was omitted, his language is, enoi zaz misham, that means you're forgiven on the spot. You know, there's an opinion in the Gemara that Yom Kippur atones without even tshuva. Although we don't hold like that, and we don't have base mikdash, and that's complicated. But at least the act of tshuva eradicates those sins immediately. More serious sins, like transgression of negative commands, for those, you need to do tshuva and live through Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur brings the tshuva home and it takes effect. More serious transgressions, very serious ones. One needs to do tshuva, live through Yom Kippur and suffer. And only a measure of suffering brings it home. And there's one avera that needs death to bring the tshuva home. Just one. One needs all those requirements plus the moment of death. That brings the tshuva into effect and that is called Chilul Hashem, right? Desecration of Hashem's name. You do something in business that's not honest, or doesn't look honest, and your name's Cohen or Goldberg. Problematic. Very problematic. Needs death to atone. Rabbi Yehuda says you can fix those, possibly, with two methods. One is make Kiddush Hashem in the world. And one is Torah learning. Torah learning has the effect of being able to correct that as well. What is a Kiddush Hashem? You do something incredibly honest, and your name's Cohen or Goldberg. My sister went to a supermarket in Johannesburg. And she bought a whole order, and then she got home, she realized that they had given her two deodorants, and on the slip, she saw she only paid for one. So the next day, she took the deodorant back, and she went to the Portuguese lady behind the till. <coughs> she said to her, look, I only paid for one of these, I brought one back. The lady gathered together all the cashiers in the store and the manager, and they told my sister that it's the first time in 25 years that anyone ever brought anything back to that store. Now, my sister's a very good girl. I mean, I taught everything she knows. And... Um, <laughs> My sister said to them, look, I had to do it, I'm Jewish. <laughs> That's exactly, in fact, it's worth stealing a deodorant so you can take it back. <laughs> That's a Kiddush Hashem. So, that is the effect. But tshuva is always necessary. Whether it needs a, another component or not, it needs the act of tshuva. So the first component is the vidu. Let's look at that in more detail. Laws of vidu are like this. First of all, must be spoken, not thought like saying Shema or Tefillah, must be said loudly enough for one to hear. Secondly, no one else allowed to hear. Rabbi Yerna says that if you're really ashamed of this, you wouldn't let anyone else hear. Not like the Catholic religion, where you confess to someone else. Right? Not allowed to do that. It has to be private. Unless the sin was public. If you did this thing wrong publicly, you need to confess publicly. But before you get up here next Shabbos morning and say what's on your mind, speak to your local Orthodox rabbi because you can make a lot of damage. But... With that exception, it has to be a private and secret vidu. Thirdly, any language is good. It must be a language you understand. Hebrew is better because Kabbalistically, Hebrew gets through certain gates in the higher world, <coughs> which other languages don't. But it must be a language that's understood. If you want the power of Hebrew and your Hebrew is not good enough, there's a trick you can use. And that is, use another language while a minion is davening. 
right? When a minion gets together in Davins, certain gates are opened and other languages get in equally. What's the proof that a language other than Hebrew gets through with a minion? Kaddish. Right? Kaddish is only said with a minion and only said in Aramaic. There's other reasons as well, but it at least demonstrates this. And therefore, you can do chiva when a minion get together with a minion. You can do it in Shmai Koleinu, or probably the most, the easiest, is at the end of the Amidah, where you've already said Yilorotzoin, because then you can answer Kedusha, even if you're taking a long time, and you, much, you have much less expertise needed. To interrupt in the middle of a brocha and Shmona Esra, you need to know what you're doing. Here you can wait till you get to the end. In fact, the beautiful custom we have is, we, we, before we finally sign off with Yilorotzoin, we say our name. Are you familiar with that custom? Yes? No? Beautiful custom. You get to the end of the Amidah, you change from the plural into the singular, Yilorotzoin, and then you say, Lokai Netzol, Shoini Meirai, now you're speaking singular. But before you finally sign off that, you say the verse that begins with the letter your name begins with, and ends with the letter your name ends with. Right? Very beautiful hint to one's own name. And then, I mean your real name, your Hebrew name, not uh, Butch, you know, or um, <laughs> Esmeralda, you know, whatever your name is. <laughs> your real name, and you locate yourself in Torah, as a Jew, every Jewish neshama is. That's a beautiful hint to one's own name. And then you can go on in any language and say your uh, personal fillers and your tshuva. By the way, why do we sign on with our name at the end? Isn't it more natural to announce yourself in the beginning? You pick up the phone and you say, hi, this is so-and-so. Here's what I have to say. Why do we sign on at the end of the Amidah? The answer is beautiful. Signing on in the beginning, you take three steps forward and you say, Hashem, Tats is here. Mm, unfortunately, not guaranteed to get big time attention. We don't do that. We say, Eloke Avraham, Eloke Yitzhak, Eloke Yaakov. That's big time name dropping. <laughs> he mentioned those names, guaranteed big attention. And then you slip yourself in on the coattails of Jewish history at the end as a great, great grandchild. That's a beautiful and subtle way of putting yourself into that chain of merit. And then you say your own, your own, uh, your own material. And so, one does it then. So again, needs to be allowed, needs to be not for anyone else to hear, any language. And finally, says the Rambam, the more you say, the better. Vidu needs to be spoken in detail. The question is why? Normally in Torah, we like to say things brief, brief and accurate, not to be wordy. But I think the idea here is that Vidu needs to be an exploration of all the nooks and crannies of the personality that led to that insensitivity. After all, every Avera has many angles that are its generation and many angles that it leads to. You know, what, once we're frightening ourselves, I guess we might as well terrify ourselves. So let me share this with you. Every Avera, Rav Desla shows that every Avera affects virtually the whole world by the time you finish. You know, it ripples on and has effects. You do something wrong, it has effects. The effects have effects. You're accountable for the whole thing. This is really scary, by the way. You know, you know, it says that on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the books of the living and the dead are opened. It's well known. The Kabbalists ask an amazing question. Why would Hashem judge the dead? By definition, they can't be any different than they were the year before. No? Imagine someone's life proceeds like this. There's their lifespan. There's their lives. This point they die. Next year, Hashem judges them again. Next year, why? By definition, they can't be any different here than they were the year before. They're dead. They have no vessel with which to operate. No tool, no clean. They're spiritual momentum only. Coasting with the momentum they build up in life. You hear the question? There are many answers to this, but one amazing answer is this. You know why the person is judged here differently than the year before? Because many things have transpired on earth during this year that are the results of something they did back here when they were alive. Here, 500 years ago, someone died and had a child. The child had children. The children had children. Now, 500 years later, there's 7,652 great-great-grandchildren in the world. And everything that all of them are doing accrues to the credit of the person who began that process. <laughs> Scary, huh? Because you're accountable for the whole process. You do something, and it ripples on and has effects, and has effects, and has effects. You've done all of that. You know, sometimes you see dramatically a person does something, and you see the effects. Here's an example. <laughs> I, I met a person, <coughs> a, Jew, a Hasidic Jew from Brooklyn, who came to buy diamonds in South Africa. I'm telling you a first-hand story. This fellow, his mother was pregnant in the Warsaw Ghetto. And she needed to see a doctor, just before the Germans killed everyone. 
she managed to escape from the ghetto and she went to see a Christian lady gynecologist. It's a Catholic woman from the old Polish aristocracy in the old city of Warsaw. And this lady doctor treated the Jewish patient and when she was about to leave the office, the doctor said to her, do you know what's going to happen to you if you go back into the ghetto? So she said, yes. So she said, come and stay with me. So the woman said, I can't leave my husband. She said, bring him as well. She said, I can't leave my family. So she said, bring him too. So a Jewish woman went back into the ghetto and told her husband that this Christian woman is offering to save their lives. So he said, I can't leave my family. So they took him as well. They arrived at this woman's house with 13 people. She put them in the attic of her home for 22 months, including a time during which the Gestapo occupied the house. And for 22 months, she fed them and carried away their waste. There was no bathroom. There were no facilities. With her own hands, every day she kept them clean and fed them all under the noses of the Germans. 22 months later, she managed to get them out. All 13 survived, and all 13 ended up in New York City. About nine years ago in New York, there was a wedding of one of the grandchildren of one of those 13 people, and at that wedding were 200 people descended from the 13 people that she had saved 65 years before, and they went back to Poland, and they found her, and they brought her to be present. An old, old lady, to see 200 people dancing around her, the children, grandchildren, great, of the people that, and during the Suda, someone went up to her, and they said, why did you risk your life to save Jews? And she drew herself up to a full, frail height and she said, because I read Genesis. And in Genesis I saw that when Sodom was about to be destroyed, Abraham negotiated with God. And he said, if there are 50 righteous people there, will you save the city? And God said, yes. 45 righteous people? And God said, yes. And she said, and I hope there were enough of us to save Poland. And I was wrong. Well, that's something to envy, because they're all her children. And their children are her children. You know, three years ago at Gateways in Connecticut, I mentioned the story. One fellow got up at the back and he said, I was there, I'm one of the grandchildren. So you see, you do an action in the world and it ripples on and on and on and it's all yours. Good or bad. So Vidu needs to eradicate thoroughly all of the details, all the points of origin. Every Avera, when you do an Avera, you're guilty of the act. You're guilty of the time you wasted. Every time you spend half an hour doing what you shouldn't, you're guilty of the action, the infraction, and you're guilty of the time wasted. If you work for a company and you spend half a day acting disloyally for another company, your boss has two problems with you. One is you acted disloyally, and the second is you wasted time. You paid a salary. That's accountable. Then after that, very you got depressed. That's even worse, another sin. Then you got other people influenced, and they, then it became easier for you to do it again. It's another problem. Vidu needs to eradicate and evoke from the personality all the insensitivities. It's a very deep analysis, if you like. And therefore, the more you are delving, the better. This is, by the way, why people do tshuva more than once. David Amelech spent the rest of his life crying about one thing that he did in his life. For most of us, by the way, that's not a good idea. We're very weak emotionally, and most of us who do tshuva again and again for the same thing end up not trusting that Hashem's accepted the tshuva. So for most of us, it's best to do it once and maybe again on Yom Kippur. But a person strong enough spiritually could keep returning to the same area and delving deeper into the more sensitive core of the personality. And finally, there's, the post scheme say there's one exception where you should not speak out the details. And that is where you start delving into the details of the Avera and before you've, you know it, you actually quite enjoy it. You know, going over the details. It usually happens on Yom Kippur, you're sitting there, got much, not much else to do. Now you start going back over the, uh, put yourself back at the scene of the crime, and before you know it, you're actually relishing the fantasy of the memory. Not a good idea. <laughs> right? In such a case, move rapidly on, leave the details to his imagination while you still feel a little remorse, and move on, right? That's an exception where one should not... This is a big problem in the Balchuba world, by the way. Right? You know, I was not brought up religious, I was brought up normal. And, um, <laughs> and, I mean, I had a very traditional background, but the point is that in the Balchuba world, this is a real problem. Many times the Balchuba, they end up with tremendous guilt feelings for things that they did at a time where they weren't aware they were problematic in the first place. <clears throat> Lived a certain lifestyle with tremendous pleasures and things that at the time were, on the contrary, looked at as wonderful relationships, for example. Now they become religious and they start going back and there's a regret, a very interesting conflict here where there's a remorse and a regret and a shame for something that actually they weren't aware of was problematic in the first place. Very interesting issue, but that's a separate subject. So that is the vidui, the confession, those are some of the laws. Secondly, 
regret and remorse. One has to say that one wishes one hadn't done it, ashamed, regretful, that one has to say. Thirdly, I'll never do this again. This causes people a lot of questions and problems. Let me try to explain. When I say I will not do it again, it's very clear that Ramam does not mean you are saying prophetically what the future holds. Nobody can say that. What do you mean? How could you possibly say you won't do it again? Who knows what will happen to you in six months' time, how you'll be feeling, how vulnerable you will be. You're not saying what the future holds. You're saying what you mean is clearly, as I stand here now, having been through this process of tshuva, if you now put me back at the scene of the crime, and the Rambam is very specific, it has to be exactly the same scenario, with the same feelings and emotions, this time I would overcome what I did then. That's the meaning. If that's sincere, it's tshuva. Next week, next month, you do it again, you need a new tshuva. doesn't invalidate the previous tshuva. However, if one says, I won't do it again, and you don't mean that, you're already planning the next time, you're lying through your teeth. The Rambam says it's new avari, you have to do tshuva for that. In such circumstances, one should say, this is what I did, I'm sorry about it, I'm ashamed, help me not do it again, and then you put your money where your mouth is. You don't go near that area, you put protective mechanisms. You know that the most basic rule of free will in Torah is not to engage it in the first place. The correct use of free will is not to get into the zone of the choice in the first place. Gemara says, very clearly, a man's going down a road and he comes to a fork. The one road takes him home with no problem. The other takes him past a river where women are washing, they're immodestly exposed, looking at them is not going to be good. So the man says to himself, well, which road shall I take? If I take the road with no problem, what do I gain? Just get home. Take the road where the women are and do not look after all ones in the world for ordeals, right? One only grows from ordeals. Rabbi Olofsky mentioned the Masilis Yishorim. He says there are three reasons for being created. La is mitzvahs, to perform mitzvahs. La avoid, to serve. The la amod binisayon, to stand strong in ordeals. Can only grow that way. Let me take the road where the women are and not look. Says the Gemara, if he takes the road where the women are and does not look, he's a Russian evil man. Not only did he fail the test, he failed even to identify when he was being tested. Because the test was not, well, you look a lot. The test was, which road will you take? The classic Musa response is, the Bale Musa say, if you take that road, you've lost because either you'll look and fall into Taiva, lust, or you won't look and you'll fall into Gaiva. I managed. There's only one solution, and that is to chicken out. Conquest of ego. That means not to prove. If there were two roads, one had a poisonous snake poised to strike, would you try and duck and dodge the snake? You know, to prove there's no thou shalt be dramatic. You know, that's a mistake. <laughs> if you have a bottle of poison at home, you put it on the table next to the wine to see if you remember to drink the wine, not the poison. You know, you lock it up, you throw it out, you don't play with it. Every morning we dive in the Altavienu Loli Deni Sayon. Hashem, don't give me any tests. Ah, you can only grow from tests. And Sadiq says, Hashem, you keep the growth and the reward. Just don't let me do any damage in your world. Practical use of free will, don't engage it. When you next buy a home, buy a home next to the rabbi. Because you'll be too darn ashamed to walk around in your underwear. You might walk in. <laughs> Put yourself in a situation that will... You know, many young people complain to me that they have an addiction, internet addiction. What they're really usually worried about is not what they're watching, but the fact that they haven't slept for three, four, five nights. Sitting on the computer, age 14, 15, 16, semi-psychotic with sleep deprivation. What do you tell a young person like that? Stop clicking? Today you don't have to click, they put it in your face. The only solution is I tell them, put the computer on the kitchen table where your mother's watching you. That's the only solution. Put yourself in a situation that brings out the correct and prevents the bad. Not don't engage the ordeal in an illegitimate fashion. And therefore, one says, Hashem, this is what I've done. And then you take steps to make that a... So therefore, you have these three components, right? What does that affect? Amazing change in the character. You know, there are two levels of chiva that can be affected here. One is called chiva miyura and one is chiva miyava. Explain briefly. Chiva miyura means that a person regrets what they've done and won't do it again, but only out of fear of punishment. That does not affect a change in the past to the extent that the past is converted into merits. Chuvah mi'ava means you regret what you've done, not because you're afraid of punishment, but intrinsically have become better. You don't want that thing anymore. That converts the past negative into positive. Our various, so to speak, become mitzvahs. A beautiful mechanism to understand. Let me try to demonstrate this, why this is so. First of all, you see logically it's like this. Chuvah mi'ira means fear. Mother says to the child, don't touch the chocolate chip cookies. 
Mother goes out, kid eats a chocolate chip cookies. Mother comes back, punishes the child, right? You Americans, you have no idea what punishment is. I mean, you are... You know, I grew up in a world where we got beaten with a cane, you know that? If I misbehaved at school, I had to bend down on the headmaster's table, we got hit with a cane. I used to wear double underwear to school. <laughs> we used to go and look at the marks afterwards. That's why I turned out a man and you wimps and nerds. <laughs> so, imagine you live in a world like that, right? Mother comes home, kid ate the chocolate chip cookies, so now, you know, the kid's getting beaten with a motorcycle chain or whatever you ladies keep to have and that sort of thing. Now, um, then the mother goes out again and says, don't touch the cookies. Why does the child not touch the cookies this time? He's afraid of being punished. That's not, that's Chuba Miura. That means, yes, he's a better child, he has self-control, but he hasn't changed intrinsically. What's the proof? If he could get away with it, he would. Still has the same illicit desire. Chuba Miura means the child reaches a level where even if he could get away with it, he wouldn't. He's reached such a level of understanding of what it means that he doesn't want to do it again. And that is an intrinsically better person. You know, if you want a mechanism, I'll demonstrate like this. Imagine a person who's coasting along at a certain spiritual level, and they hit a temptation, and they crash. Succumb to the temptation, scarred spiritually. They're moving along now to a lower level. Later in their life, they do chuva. Definition of chuva, eradicates the sin, back where you were before. That's chuva miyura. Here's Chuba Miyama. Person is coasting along at a certain spiritual level, and they hit an obstruction, and they are tempted and they sin, and they fall. But listen well. Here's this person before they sin. What kind of person is this? This is a person who is not tainted by sin, but a person with a problematic personality. They have a flaw in their character that if stressed by temptation will cause them to crash. This is a person who drives one of these big four-wheel drive monsters that I see all you Americans need to get down town. You, know, so you drive this big thing, it's got a crack in its back axle. You don't know about it. You roll back over the curve, the axle breaks. Big hassle. But next month when you're 500 miles from nowhere in Death Valley, boy, are you glad that the axle cracked then and you had it welded. Because it won't break there again. You know, sometimes I look at a patient's x-ray and I say to them, you broke your leg 10 years ago. And the patient says, hey doc, how'd you know? The reason is because the bone always breaks at its weakest place but never breaks there again. When a fracture heals, it always gets thicker around the place where it broke. It'll never break there again. So here's a person who's got a flaw in his character, doesn't know about it, hits temptation and crashes. What's the definition of chuba, says the Rambam? When you get to a place where you do chuba to the extent that if you'd be put back in exactly the same situation, you wouldn't do it again. Oh, this is a better person than he was before. This was a person who, tempted by this particular ordeal, would crash. The, this circumstance that is for them has led him to be the kind of person that, by definition, wouldn't do it again. Do you see what's happening? This crash has become an inalienable part in his growth. He now looks back with a relish to the moment when he fell. Because it brought about the discovery of the flaw and the welding of that flaw to its elimination. And that's why a tshuva turns the damage of the past into merits. Right? And therefore, Chuba Mi'ava leaves the person a better person than they were before. There's an elimination of that vulnerability. And that is the, if you like, the graphic demonstration of the, of the mechanisms here. For homework, by the way, if you want some challenging homework, think about this. What happens to a person who is coasting along at a low level, does a mitzvah, and then regrets the mitzvah? Where do they end up? Lower than they were before. Why? Here's a person who's never done a mitzvah. Puts themselves out. I'm talking about a mitzvah that takes him on. Right? person has a little money. They need it desperately. Someone else needs it more. They give it away. Whew. Amazing. Growth. Two hours later, someone walks in and says, Have you got a certain amount of money? Give it. You'll be rich for life. Ooh. Tremendous regret. How much regret? To the point that they never do it again. Ooh, they're a worse person than they were before. This person never did the mitzvah. They had the potential. Given the right opportunity, they would rise to their occasion. Now they regret it to the point that they wouldn't do it again. They shouldn't have done that mitzvah. They weren't ready for it. Too risky, too dangerous. They stuck their neck out too far in Emona. Long subject in its own right. But how does that balance work? Interesting thought. Is it exactly parallel? What does it mean in terms of the Chavetz Chaim's answer? There's a lot to think about. Let's finish briefly with considering the two components of the sin that involves someone else, if we may. Here's where it gets tough. Vidui, straightforward. Regret and remorse, no problem. Undertaking for the future, if you're honest, that's fine. By the way, 
You know, when we do this on Yom Kippur, we never say the third component. Yom Kippur. We confess time and again. Remorse, shame, regret, plenty. There's no way on Yom Kippur where we say, I will not do this again. Why not? You can't do Chiba without that. You cannot do Chiba without the three components. Why is there no way in the Machs or a statement that I'll never do this again? You're not giving a second chance. Why? You're not giving a second chance. What do you mean? Right now as I stand, I've conquered the issue. I've killed it. I left it behind. Why don't we say that? No, you have to say in Chiba that I won't do this thing again. That's what you have to say. But here's the reason. Because all our tefillahs are always done in the plural. As we mentioned before. It's always us. Well, we can say we sinned for sure. We can say together that we have remorse. Absolutely, that's what we're doing here on Yom Kippur. But I can't say you won't sin again. I can't say that. That cannot be said communally. You have to say that. Some say that in the end of the Amidah, you know there's an unusual line that's inserted. You notice that on Yom Kippur? There's a line that says, you know, you say, Yilorotzein, right? When you, Elokai Netzor, in the middle of that verse, of that paragraph, there's an additional line. Yirotza milfonecho, you say, Shelo echetzaoit, that I will not sin again, and that you eliminate what I've done, but not by means of difficult illnesses and pain and so forth and so on. So some say that's at least a reference to the future that I shall not sin again. But it's much better to make it explicit. And therefore, that third component needs to be added on your own. Let's speak briefly about the last two, which are making restitution for damage that was done, and secondly, gaining forgiveness. And I'm warning you, this is where it gets difficult. Very briefly. First of all, making up the damage. The simple case, of course, is money's outstanding. You work for a company. There was a day where you perhaps didn't go to work uh, without due cause, and you were paid salary. You have to give the money back. Simple formulation, make a calculation of the amount of money, it has to be paid back where it came from. There's no requirement, by the way, that the person knows about it. That comes under Mechile, we'll get there. But making up the damage, the naked bare law is, you have to give back the amount, or pay for the damage. Don't have to necessarily tell the person. What happens if you can't? What happens if you can't find them? What happens if they're not alive? What happens if it was many people? One person said to me, he's a very wealthy man, he came to me and he said, I've been running a business for 25 years, very successful business. For 25 years, I've been overcharging and undersupplying. Now I want to do Chuba. Chuba. He can't find the people, Jews, non Jews, thousands of people. He's not worth enough to pay it all back. What do you do? So, all of these can be dealt with. The Rambam and others speak about them. You can ask your rabbi if you have personal concern. Each of these situations can be solved. For example, if the person's not alive, the money has to be given to the estate or the inheritors where the value would have gone. Or if there are many people that can't be found, then other Boiskim say what you should do is make a calculation of the amount of money outstanding. And even if you have to pay it over time, you pay the money to a public cause, something for the community. Because although it's not the same as getting it back to the individual, it will ripple back to the person or their family or their descendants or where the value should have gone. And Hashem will see to it that 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 works. And therefore, that's a potential solution. And each situation can be corrected, but it needs to be done. Ideally, of course, it should be given back specifically to the source. By the way, that can be very difficult too. Imagine somebody who owes someone a fortune because it was ill-gotten from that person. Now, they don't want to tell them that they're giving it back. One man said to me, if I, give, if I tell the person what I do, he'll destroy me. But I have to give him back the money. If you think it's hard to get a large sum out of somebody, try giving a large sum to somebody without any explanation interesting problem but it can be done and it must be done so first issue is giving back the damage and finally how do you get forgiveness so the simple case is you go up to the person you say look this problem we've been having is ridiculous life's too short for this kind of thing forgive each other I forgive you that is by far the ideal situation the Rambam says if the person refuses to forgive you send a friend, you send their friends, you email, he doesn't say email, but that's what he means. You make application, you ask the person a few times. If they continue refusing, it becomes their problem. It's called a cruelty. It's inappropriate and it's their problem, unless it's your Torah teacher. If it's your Torah teacher, your Rebbe, you have to go back a thousand times. If he's not forgiving you, there's a reason. Classic case in the Gemara of this. And that's what you have to do. By the way, what if someone asks you for forgiveness and you find you can't? You've been hurt too badly? destructive relationship many years your life was 
How do you find it in your heart? By the way, according to most authorities, forgiveness is valid, mechila, even if it's not asked for. There's a machlaikas here where there's an argument halakhically, do you need to make apology or simply evoke mechila? The bottom line seems to be, even if it's not asked for, as long as it's given, it's valid. What happens if you can't give the forgiveness? There are two ulterior motives here that can be used. One is, realize it's not good for you to carry this grudge around that you have against someone else. It's unhealthy psychologically. Let it go. Forgive them for your benefit. And perhaps more deeply is this. Imagine someone needs your forgiveness and you emotionally just cannot find it in your heart to forgive them. Bear this in mind. One day you'll be standing in judgment and Hashem is going to be looking at you and judging you with all the din you heard of before and you're going to say, Hashem, forgive me and you won't deserve to be forgiven. You're not going to get forgiven. This is called din. Din means you're going to get what you deserve. Try going to an American court and saying, Your Honor, I'm guilty, but would you forgive me? If the judge knows his business, he's going to have you up for contempt of court. This is a court of law, not a social welfare department. And therefore, if you stand in judgment when you die, on Rosh Hashanah, on Yom Kippur, when your soul is judged when you sleep at night, and you say, Hashem, I'm guilty, but forgive me. You're my din, you're not going to get forgiven. There's only one way you can get forgiven if you don't deserve it. If you once forgave someone who did not deserve it, then when you need forgiveness, when you don't deserve it, you're going to get forgiven. Because you do deserve it, because that's what you did. And Hashem runs the world, midak and neged midak. It's not the highest motivation for forgiving somebody. It's good enough, it's kosher. And you need to use it as a, a spiritual or psychological motivation, emotional, and you forgive the person. That is the correct procedure. By the way, we say a most beautiful tefillah zaka. It's not a Sfari custom, but as far as Sfari certainly can do this. In Ashkenazi Machso, you'll see before Yom Kippur, tefillah zaka, most emotional and beautiful prayer, very humiliating. Begins by going through each part of your body and what you've been doing with it. Quite brutal. And then shortly after that, you get to a section which says, Hashem, if there's anyone out there that needs my forgiveness, even if they haven't asked me, I hereby forgive anybody. I don't want to go through your kippur with anyone's problems on my conscience. I'm not talking about forgiving a debt or money. I'm talking about the emotional stuff. I forgive them. And in the merit of this, put into the hearts of anyone out there whose forgiveness I need, they should forgive me at this time. Let it go, Mechila. That is what one should do. But what happens if you can't face the person? What if you're too ashamed? What happens if they don't know it was you? You know, I've, I've come across families where first cousins have never met. You know why? Because the parents don't speak to each other. You know why? No, they don't know why. They've forgotten. 35 years ago, someone was late for someone's bar mitzvah. Like they, their first cousins have never met and they don't know why. That's why the temple has not been rebuilt. That's absolutely ridiculous. If you have someone like that in your family, when you get home, you phone them, you call them, you blame me, Tats told me to do it. You call them up and you say, this is ridiculous, let's make peace. I learned with a fellow last week, he told me, he has cousins in his family, where the, two, the son and the daughter haven't spoken to their father for 30 years. And last week he was visiting with the city where they live, and in view of this, as Elul, he called up the son and the daughter and he says, Ridiculous, go and see your father. And the next day they both called their father, they went to see him, made peace with him. Ridiculous, life's too short for that kind of thing. But what happens if you can't? The person doesn't know it was you. You walk up and you say, I'm the person who's been sticking a knife in your back for the last 20 years. What's going to happen? First of all, they may punch you in the nose. That's revenge, a Torah prohibition. Then they bear a grudge against you the rest of your life, another prohibition. And they won't forgive you anyway. So what do you do? Let me finish with this. This is a complicated halachic area, but there are, poiskim, there are halachic authorities who say you can ask a person for forgiveness without telling them what you did. This is dubious. I'm telling you it's doubtful. There's an argument about it. But there's a weighty opinion that says you can get forgiveness without specifying the sin. How do you do it? There's a wrong way and a right way. Here's the wrong way. Wrong way. You walk up to the person and you say to them, you don't know what I did to you. <laughs> but could you forgive me? That's wrong, okay? Because then people's imagination starts running wild. So what you do? This is what you do. You walk up to the person and you say, hi, how are you doing? And they say, yes. And you say, you know, just before Rosh Hashanah. <coughs> and they say, yes. You say, you know, I went to this amazing talk in Edison a few nights ago where this fellow explained the laws of Chiv and he said, that we have a beautiful custom in Jewish families. That before Rosh Hashanah, we all forgive each other for anything that happened. Isn't that amazing? 
<laughs> and then you say, and so I've just come to tell you that I forgive you for anything that might have happened. And by the way, I'm not saying anything happened, but like, in our relationship, possibly somewhere along the line, I was less than perfect. Would you mind forgiving me? And if they say yes, you got it. If you sign a check and you give it to me and I fill the amount in, the check's valid, provided you have enough cover in your bank. In other words, when the person says yes, they forgive, they have to be sincere. If they think it's some sort of ritual and they don't mean it, that's completely invalid. The person has to mean whatever it is, even to the tune of whatever it might be, I genuinely forgive. And by the way, those authorities who hold this say, even if the person's pettiness would obstruct them and, and, and prevent them from giving you the mechila, if they knew what it was, but now that they're not obstructed by their pettiness because they don't know what it is, they can afford to be magnanimous and big and say, I forgive you. If they mean that, you got it. I think a classic illustration of this would be, imagine if a child goes to a parent and they say, you know, Abba, I haven't been a perfect son. Last year, things have happened. I don't want to go into detail. I'm too ashamed. I need your forgiveness. Are there many parents who would not say yes with a full heart? I don't think so. And therefore, if a person says yes and I forgive, if it's meant sincerely, then it is a very good way of achieving this forgiveness rather than going through messy details where there's very dubious whether the person will in fact forgive. So what we learned this evening was, and I'm sure this is all completely unnecessary for you, I'm sure you all spiritually pure as the driven snow, <laughs> and this is purely academic, but for those of us who have anything on our conscience, this is the thing to focus on, this is the time to do it, Slichas and Elul, before Rosh Hashanah, is the work of these three steps, first fixing what a person did with other people, sincerely, and then going through these three steps, Rosh Hashanah, we don't do that, that's a day of simply returning to essence, declaring that Hashem is king, and that we represent that rule in the world. And then until Yom Kippur is the time for getting busy pruning all the details. And that will leave us in Mitzvah Shem, that we all have a Ksiva Chasimah